Hey, I ain't never done any of this before. So. You'll be fine. It's so. fun. You'll be fine. All right. Welcome to Hoosier Harwoods Live. Um, tonight we got a great show. We've got Andrew Alt, who is a fish and wildlife biologist, to give us some. I we've talked on the way over here, and I it's, he's it's, a little above us, but there's some great stuff to talk yeah. about. So, yeah, um, does a good job. First, we'll start off with our news for this episode. First thing I want to go over is the Washington County Fraternal, Fraternal Order of Police is doing an awesome thing this year. They are giving away a youth turkey hunt. Um, really? I was, yeah, I was scrolling through Facebook the other day and noticed that Fopila County. That's awesome right there. That's Tickets amazing. for entry into the draw are $10 a piece. All participants must be less than 18 years of age and possess a valid Indiana hunting license on the day of the hunt. Participants may be accompanied by a parent or guardian during the hunt. A liability waiver will be required to be completed if selected for the hunt. Required equipment may be provided if needed, which is a cool deal because if yeah. the kid doesn't, you know, it's a good opportunity. And the drawing will occur on April 15th, 2019, and winners will be notified by telephone. If you have any questions, may be directed via email to, there's an email address on here. This will be on our Hoosier Hardwoods Facebook page for anybody to look up if they're interested. And there are two um, ticket sites you can go to. It's Red Barn Bait Shop in Salem and Weapons Pro in Salem. So that, that makes locations. me want to be a kid. Yes. I, I mean, mean, that's a great that's, opportunity. That is an I opportunity mean. right there. So I, mean, I did talk to Eric and this awesome. is something this is the first year for, and they're really wanting to take off for, you know, it's a good opportunity for the kids to get into a yeah. drawing. So check, make sure you check that out on our Facebook page. Also, um, we were off last week cause we were in the sun on the beach. I wasn't. Some of us were it. here oh, in Indiana, nice. but it was nice right here. But my son is in the military and he was, uh, at Atterbury training. I didn't know at the time. I totally didn't look at my all the comments on there. As I, I was add. trying to get your attention. But yes, you were. I, I was. I was but I want to give out to a shout out to the 215th Air Support Medical Company because they the whole barracks was watching our podcast. That's that awesome. And thanks for you guys yes, being there. Thanks for we protecting definitely us. support. You know, we yes, preach a support. lot for the youth, but I mean, the military is. I don't want to get too political, but the military is huge. I, I, yeah. The things that them guys go through. I mean, you hear all these stories about how they're, you know, they come back from deployment and they're homeless and they're, there's no yeah. reason for that. If somebody sure. serves in the military, they shouldn't have to worry about um, housing forever, in my opinion. But um, so anyway, that's the two things I want to go over with. So shout out to those guys and thank you for thank what you, you do and, and keep going. So I know Merle's got some more news. So what you got, Merle? Well, we got the 2019 outdoor women at big oaks again it's it's women 12 and up um they can do all kinds of field skills knowledge courses as fly fishing kayaking canoeing bird watching archery and registration is it's the registration fee includes a choice of four courses breakfast lunch refreshments equipment the whole nine and there's more stuff to come as you look that stuff up um we have the accuracy unlimited this right here kind of intrigued me it's Accuracy Unlimited Gun Law Seminar. That's huge. Yes, and it is Saturday, April the 6th from 1 to 3. The cost is free, but reservations are required, and you can sign up at www.gunlawseminar.com, promo code FRIEND, to make a free event or call Accuracy Unlimited. Now, that is, that, that's a good thing. Yes. I mean, I mean, if you have any questions or anything as far as the gun laws and stuff go, Andrew, I mean, have you ever heard anything like that? I've heard everything under the sun, you know, somebody trying to do the right thing and they're thrown in jail. Correct. And it's all because they did not know proper procedures. Um, right. I've, I've got a couple of lawyer buddies down in Kentucky that I knew where I went to school and guy told us, I mean, it's, there are specific things that you need to do and it is to prevent any liability towards you. Correct. So Accuracy Unlimited will be going over all that stuff. And then we got the Muscatatak National Wildlife Refuge events. Um, it's a pollinator festival and an earth cleanup day, April the 13th at 9 a.m. And then it's a family fishing workshop. Yep. Um, you can vis visit the Facebook page or call 812-522-4352. And then Clifty Falls are having the Wild About Flowers event. It's all about the pollinator, edible plants, and stuff like that, which, I mean, that's a good thing. I mean, you know, oh, yeah. people there's a lot of stuff to eat out there. Some people eat it, some don't. It starts Saturday, April 6th at 10 a.m. Um, Hardy Lake, they're having a spring birding hike. 
um, from 10 to 12. And then the Friends of Muscat Attack are having their cleanup day and stuff again, April 27th. And everybody can come on. Lunch is provided. Um, you can go to forms.org or their Facebook page at the uh, Muscat Attack National Wildlife Refuge. And that's about all I got right now. Good deal. All right. So this week we're going to do something different. We're going to add some Andy to this week. So yes, you, sir. you have to make sure you, you're watching. <laughs> yes. Now, I know we got a lot of followers and a lot of guys enjoy the show and ladies. But we got some giveaways this week. We got two different questions. Yeah. One large pizza certificate. And then at some other point in the show, we're going to ask another question and give away another large pizza. So One topping pizza. Pay free. attention. Get a free pay pizza. Attention. Pay attention here. Okay. All right. So... Andrew, thanks for coming. Appreciate We're you glad to have me. you on. I don't know where this conversation is going to go because yeah. you're a wildlife biologist and we love to hunt and fish, so we're willing to learn anything we can learn. So, yeah. So, what actually, you know, we were talking a little bit on the way over here. Where did this whole hunting and wildlife thing start for states in particular? Because I know it's not just Indiana. Yeah. There's nationwide it's it's it started at some point in time yeah so essentially back in the early you know whenever this country was founded the whole thing was the u.s it was the people's wildlife you know that deer that's in a cornfield is just as much your deer as mine now that's not saying go to somebody's property but that's right. just saying that is the people's wildlife it goes back to you know the middle ages when you had the lord of the castle that was the king's deer that was the lord's deer being the lord of whatever castle or whatever and it was a great crime it was a people were put to death for killing the king's deer in his in the king's land now being that most of the immigrants that came over the pilgrims all the colon all the colonists they were very much i don't want to say lower class but definitely kind of your middle class your merchants there weren't very many there wasn't much of an aristocrat aristocracy as they but did they in was Europe. they were working for the king making him money doing his bidding exactly yeah. so when this country was founded you know it was the people's you know and they had to back in those days they had to for sustenance i mean you go back look at some of those pictures in the 1800s you got markets that have 10 12 deer hanging and that's how people hunt and Unfortunately, getting towards later half, you know, another thing they talk about is the 18, 1850s and 70s, the trap, or even early 1800s, the beaver trapping heyday. You had the buffalo hunt, the buff big buffalo hunters. The whole, and that's all in a place called market hunting, marketing that natural resource. So, so were they bartering, Andrew, with some of the harvest and stuff that they got, yeah, basically actually, with the furs and the pelts? And that's everything actually where forth? you get the term bucks. Bucks. You know, people would trade buck skins. And, Correct. You know, that's yeah. where you, bucks. hey, yeah. you know, hey buck. I got a couple yeah. bucks. That's where it came from. Um, and so eventually towards the later half of the 19th century and into the 20th century, people were starting to, you had the older older generation thing. Man, we ain't got the deer we used to. We ain't got the buffalo. We ain't got the elk. And that's all due to over-harvest. That was due to habitat encroachment, which still goes on today. That is the leading cause of wildlife um, degradation. You now, know, you touch on that. Habitat encroachment. Touch on it. Okay, so essentially what that is, that's urban sprawl. You know, Thank cities you. and towns getting Just wanted to hear it. That's all I wanted to hear. <laughs> Factory farming. Um, not, not, you know, not knocking farmers. No. But you look back 40 years ago where you had my dad, who's in his 60s, grew up hunting as a, hunting as a kid, a young man hunting quail. There used to be quail everywhere. Right. Yeah. But that's because there were smaller farms you're not having these big two three hundred acre fields you had a 50 acre wood you had a 50 acre patch with a fence going on it right and you also had what the biggest thing what uh wildlife biologists in any state or federal agency will tell you is that there it's a thing called edge now instead of you know going all the way up to the edge of the field where the trees are there was actually what's the edge habitat are the briars the flat the wildflowers and especially that's getting hit nowadays with the pollinators and that was at all your quail habitat. That was your rabbit habitat. Rabbits is a big one. Oh, yeah. yeah. But and we it, like to eat our rabbits. Yes. I've eaten many a rabbit. I'm Barbecue sauce good. roller, you're in the rabbit, bud. Oh, I'm good with rabbit. We're just roll it in there and bread it. <laughs> I'm good with rabbit. All right. He still ain't talked yeah. to the coon situation. We're going to get so yeah. We go back to the early 1900s, you know, especially water, you know, ask any kind of, anybody that's a waterfowl hunter, they'll tell you that the market hunting days for feathers, because you look at the early, the 20s, what every what was the big fashion thing? It was feathers, quackheads, bud. Yeah, yeah. 
So you had these guys market hunting. They had the punt guns. I don't know if you've ever seen those, but those are the giant shotguns that are mounted onto a boat. They're about foot in diameter. And they would really? Just and wait, they shot the pellets out of that thing? Shot like the that? pellets out. Oh, wow. I didn't and know that. that. What that has done, that created over harvest. And that's kind of a, that's a term we use. Um, state and federal agencies will use. Another thing, you know, it started coming up, and so you had these people thinking, well, where's my... Where's my wildlife? Where are the yeah, you know, where are the streams? No yeah. conservation. No, yeah. So that's where it was kind of born. Um, I'll tell you, Theodore Roosevelt was the president that pushed it all through. Theodore Roosevelt is a great sportsman. Any books or biographies you can read about him, I know there's a few out there about his African safaris. And then there's a guy named Ding Darling. He was another very important. He was on his, uh, I believe it was chief of staff. He was on in his president's cabinet at some point. And then when I was going to college, I'm a graduate of Eastern Kentucky University with a wildlife management ma wildlife management degree. Was you glad to get back across the river, bud, when you were done? Oh, just a little bit. I had a lot of fun. I, I wouldn't be, and the reason I just, I made a joke about that is, is because I watch Kentucky Field and stuff a lot. Yeah. And I watch a lot of shows down there. Um, I watch them burn everything down. They plant all that stuff back yeah. in, in native stuff. Yes. Oh, yeah. And man, they have went back to these places. I mean, quail, I've grouse, been there. Air, yeah, and, uh, and they're thriving. Yeah. They are flat thriving, and, you know, more states ought to be accustomed to that stuff. And that's another thing, too. People don't, and a lot of people don't realize is there was disturbance. Whenever the Native Americans were here, they yeah. burned. They did, they were the originators of prescribed fire. And prescribed fire is a huge thing for all your game bird species, your, tur your turkeys, your quail, pheasant, what have you. Prescribed burning is a great thing, and a lot of people don't yeah, understand I've that. I've watched it. It's, it's cool, yeah. I've participated on many of burns. Um, I can tell you it's a very thrilling experience. Um, I can understand why firefighters do what they do, because I've walked through a field with a drip torch and... Was you scared, watched... bud? What would you think about that, in all honesty? Uh, it was a little interesting the first time. The first time I was just a little bit scared, because they, they do what, um, especially with a windy day, they do what's called a head fire, and that's the first thing they do is burn an area outside that's downwind of where they're wanting to light the head fire, and it gives it an extra fire break. And what that does, it just makes sure it doesn't spread. And so that's always the that's always the big thing. Fire is great. Man has always known that for thousands of years, but if, as long as it's controlled. Right. That's what I was going to ask: is how do you control? Like, if I want to go in there and just burn a field off, how do you control that? Like. Um, for food plot purposes or whatever, how do you... So, essentially, and I would highly recommend talking to your district, whoever, there's private lands biologists in every state, you know, talk to her. I know a uh, lady down here, her name's Shannon Wink, she's a great individual. My Worked neighbor too, bud, quality people out my way. Yeah, them Tampico people. Well, I'll tell you. <laughs> but, um, so we go back to the, and we got started getting into the 30s, and we start, his name, we kind of call him the godfather of wildlife management. His name was Aldo Leopold. I would encourage any yeah. hunter, angler, conservationist, environmentalist to read his works. He is re he was a graduate of the Yale School of Forestry, which is no longer here. It used to that was the only way you could get into get into any kind of fish and wildlife is go to the Yale School of Forestry. Yeah. Um, he actually founded the wildlife management program at Iowa State University. That is the original wildlife management fish and wildlife management school. Hmm. And as far as my knowledge, I mean, I right. this is just what I was taught back in. Way back in 2013, I cannot believe I just said that. But you're right. old. Way Matt, back. Now you went to I, you went to Salem, right? And I went to Brownstown. But why do I keep thinking you go? I to don't Salem? know. But, but did you have you read that book? By that guy? I haven't, but I need to. Yeah, I've read parts of it. Two, it is a good book. Two of the best works I will recommend is the Sand County Sand County Almanac and the Land Ethic. The Land Ethic is more of a it's an essay. It's not necessarily a book. Um, and he just goes in and talks about people being stewards of the land you know we pride ourselves as hunters and anglers that we are the stewards of the land and which is true and i'll go into that a little bit later so you get it so now we're fast forward to the 30s 1937 is one of the biggest years for fish and wildlife that is when 30s when a lot of agencies were created u.s fish and wildlife search been a little bit longer but the idea of state and federal state agencies became more apparent now i've got a question andrew mm -hmm. since you're getting into that point the tva the Tennessee Valley Authority, mm -hmm. how is that different from what you're talking about right now? So essentially, if I'm understanding this correctly, I'm not too familiar with it. The TVA um, put people to work. Yeah. Land management, lakes. Yes. All okay, that so you're talking yep. like FDR's public works. Correct. So that what that started was a lot of more concern. Again, it's in that era of kind of, I'll 
kind of like a renaissance. People right. started realizing that, hey, we need a, this is going away. We're wasting the land away. You know, had the great dust bowls of the 30s. The 30s yeah. Right. And you had all the storms. Hey, look, what do we got to do to fix this? Now, it started a little rocky. Um, you know, you had like coal mine fields. They were getting planted in what we now, you know, what's called like Cerisa Lespedeza, Kentucky 31. They're great soil binders, but they're not necessarily the best thing you can plant out there for wildlife. I know I've cut open a few quail crops, and we've counted over a thousand seeds in the crop of a quail. Wow. So, I mean, that thing was plumb full, but it's not getting that nutrition. That's another thing that they started realizing that you can't just throw, like, especially birds like pheasant, quail, you can't just throw them out there. You got to... We started realizing that in the early 2000s, it's habitat. Habitat yeah. is the biggest yeah. thing. You know, I know one thing in Indiana that we deal with is beech and maple encroachment. So that's, you know, oak tree falls down, beech maple trees come up. And as a deer hunter, people don't like that. You know, people, because you want your white oaks. That there's no, right. there's no nut there. There's no mast, and what we call mast production. Right, mass production. Green briars too, bud. Got to yeah. have in briars. Well, and even then, sometimes you want to get a little way through it. Like I know, while well, a lot of the briars you see around here is an invasive species called multiflora rose. So yeah. again, with as we are a nation of immigrants, people brought plants over. Um, you know, a lot of things you got to do. Things we have problems with came over from Asia. You know, emerald ash borer. You've got multiflora rose, I believe you have, and this is a big topic in the fisheries fisheries world. What they call Asian carp. What now, all carp are from Asia. They're good to eat, Matt. You need to try to eat one of those. They're not bad. I've had a, I've had a little bit. They say it ain't bad. I don't know. If it's, it's just like everything else. If it's fixed right. Now, I've got a question here. Mm-hmm. A lot of, a lot of people who do deer hunt and have some of the outfitters and stuff. Some things that they don't tell you. They have the sixty yard burn around tree stands. Mm-hmm. So, do you believe that? And I'm just going to tell you, I had, a, I had a property logged out. Mm-hmm. And when they drug that up there, the log yard was right there. It's not essential as burning, but all the green, everything was stripped. So this thing just yeah. went back to. So that's, that is the best place on the whole property. Yeah. All the all the natives, it just seems like the native stuff come back. So disturbance. That's another thing wildlife managers will talk about is disturbance. Burning, uh, disc up, burn, burning, disc up. Something that changes the habit just a little bit, just tweaks it. Right. Um. So there was a study done at Mississippi State down in their deer lab. They have a deer farm. They have a captive deer farm and a high fence farm. Now, captive, and I'm reason that it's important that I but you might be able that. to kill one the high See, fence yeah. farm. The captive, they analyze like antler growth, stuff like that, and help out with people that do captive deer farms. The high fence farm is kind of more of a way to keep the deer in and and analyze and study natural deer behavior. So what they did, and I encourage anybody to look it up, it's Miss, it's amazing Facebook page, Mississippi State Deer Lab. Mississippi, I'll have to look it up. Yeah. And they did a study, and I believe I can't remember if it's a master's or a PhD project, but essentially what they did was do those 30 to 60 yard burns around a tree, typically a tree stand, just so it gets a little bit native grasses, a little bit of native grasses, forbs to grow up. And they were seeing deer activity within a week. Just being right there. It's kind of creating a little mini food plot. Bud, you learn, I'm learning you something. Yeah, I know. See, I, I brought that up. Now, then we got the Andrew's specialist Andrew's learning here. me something. But he's teaching. Not you. But I had to bring the topic up. Okay. See, knowledge. We'll give you the knowledge credit. Knowledge is we'll give, key. We'll give you the credit. But another thing, you know, a lot of people can do, people don't realize how much you can do. And just the littlest thing makes it in the long run. You know, you have, um, I was hunting on a property and the neighbors were all in CRP, which uh, allows like set aside programs. Yeah, the and crop. So what that does, it reverts it back yep. to natural habitat. And we had we were seeing deer. We were I had and the thing was this was a hay field, and we were watching deer walk three hundred yards or more, cross property line to ours where we had food. Now this was a little different. Now I'm I'm a fan of food plots where they're needed. Indiana may not necessarily need them if you got a 100 acre cornfield there's a food source there that's another thing as a hunter but we had we need to have a food plot because the nearest uh corn f- ag- agricultural field was up and down two hollers right now i learned in kentucky it's a holler not a hollow yeah yeah 
It's a holler. Um, but it depends on which political part of Tennessee and Kentucky, south of the Ohio River you're at, because they call them hollers. Yeah. And they call them hollow, like they have bear hollow. So to, so, so to ask a question on that, so I have a farm that I hunt that has no food source. Where's that at, bud? Washington County. All right. But the neighbors have crop fields. Mm-hmm. So is it a good idea to plant that food plot to keep them on our place or again that's one of those where it might be needed if you want to keep deer and have deer feeding on your property that is something i would recommend okay because we have no food source whatsoever yeah. you gotta and have it, the food no yeah, food that's no what we're struggling with. and i would highly recommend something a mixed some sort of mix you know you have your clover but and deer still eat clover in the winter time i've seen them a whole clover pot that somebody that a deer's dug up but why will they not eat that winter wheat that kills me. Once in a great while, if a deer's been really pressured, yeah, you'll don't. see them out there on that winter wheat, man, they'll just go to town on it. And then, but most of the time, not. It kind of depends, you know. If it the, must be bitter. If Is you, it bitter? Depends on the time of the year and depends on when it was planted. If you allow that head to form, the grain head, mm-hmm. they'll destroy it. Um, personally, I plant oats, radishes, white top, and ladino clover. And then I'll put in turnips, too. And that covers me a year round. Yeah. Um, Another thing, too, is maybe letting native grasses take over, native grasses and forbs. You know, you look at these old buck, these huge bucks, hole in the horn buck, the Johnson buck, yeah. that were killed in the, you know, 1900s. They were, those, there were no food plots. There was not a hunting industry. But they claim that deer right there, that strain of deer, like the hole in the horn buck, mm-hmm. that was one that was originated when they brought them over here and come from Pennsylvania. Yeah. All those deer, they say that was kind of the last of the finest and that great big buck that i got at home you just don't see that anymore you don't see that big blade you just don't see that big base it's just like the deer like that genetic just died out yeah and i mean and people don't want to believe it but i mean it is what it is i mean you just don't see that yeah. the missouri so, monarch so to, to, to like that. hit that topic though i've got let's just say 100 acres right mm-hmm what do you do to get the maximum potential out of your buck herd? Yeah. Now, I understand letting them grow five, six years. I get that. But in order to get good genetics on a farm, what can a person do? Is it just nature? It, is it just... It's nature. It's, you know, that's what you said, genetics. And, you know, it's also highly illegal, I will tell you, that to bring animals from another state. That's, you know, that it's a, actually a federal violation. Right. It's called violation of what's called the Lacey Act, and like I said, thir- I 19- didn't know that, but those 1930s, that is when I all of that. our laws came in. That's your Migratory Bird Treaty Act to protect migratory waterfowl again from the market hunting days. You know, you're not allowed to kill a bird that is flying. You know, that migrates. You know, essentially, the federal, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service protects every single bird except quail, quail, wild turkey. That's a, and pheasants. All your waterfowl, that's why everyone buys a waterfowl stamp. Now, that's another thing I'll talk about in the 30s. And I get asked this all the time. I've been asked this I've when I was in college, when I was in Kentucky. Um, why do I need a hunting license? And this was the best way for a hunter or angler. These, and all the people that suggested this legislation, it was all federal acts of Congress. Commonly called Pitt Robertson Act and Dingle Johnson Act. That's all passed 1937, along with the federal duck stamp. These were hunters and anglers coming together and saying, "We will tax ourselves. Let let us pay for it." And that's why you always see on you know you see it online, you see it here on TV shows. Hunters are the conservationists, right. and that's because we are, but we spend the money. Yeah, it's because it's a user pay system. It's not, you know, most most fish and wildlife agencies, U.S. Fed, operate on hunting license, hunting and fishing license sales. And what it goes into, so let's, I'm going to round this down. The Indiana Deer License Bundle is $60. That goes into a pool that says, okay, Indiana sold this license. That lo- that money is then reimbursed threefold from the federal government. And where that where they get that threefold reimbursement from is by those two acts, Pitt Robinson, Dingle Johnson. Pitt Robinson covers guns, ammo, archery equipment, um, and then Dingle Johnson, fishing rods, reels, lures. That's why, and it's an excise tax, just like a gas tax. It's just for those that use it, they pay it. And so that gets pulled in, and then the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service then divvies that out to states based on the number of license sales. Gotcha. And so the more money that, the more licenses that a state raises, the more money they get from the federal government. So you don't want them to bring back a lifetime license? 
Just say it. This is what this show is all about. You don't want to see that, do you? Or yes. That one's kind of a hot topic right there. Correct. Um, you know, that was that is a very hot topic because you know, it might not come back. You know, that's the thing. Once you buy it, mm-hmm. it's for life. Um, other states have that, and it does work. Another thing states do, I know Kentucky does this. Kentucky, Wyoming, um, just because I've looked at and I've hunted and I've hunted out there, it's called a sportsman's license or an yeah. outdoorsman license, where it's $100, 150, $130, 150 bucks. I know in Kentucky it's 95 I believe. I could be wrong. It's something like um, I think I looked the other day. But so, yeah. it's that, and that covers everything you need except the federal duck stamp. Now, that's another thing. You know, that's 1937. That's when Ducks and Linwood was founded. And they said, hey, well, let's impose this tax on ourselves. That way we know that we pay this now. I, back then it was like a dollar, if yeah. that. Now it's $25. That $25 is specifically spent on waterfowl management. Gotcha. And that's a really cool thing. I mean, And plus yeah. it kind of creates a little collectible. I mean, I've got duck stamps every year I've, ever since I started duck hunting and I get it every year. I even try and find uh, I know ducks Unlimited is a big proponent of them, but they do these little picture frames where they have a, like an eight and a half by 11. And I always try and get one. I've got all, but my first year. That's pretty cool. Um, and then then um, going back to that lifetime license deal. And, and that's a good point that you bring up is the fact of, you know, as hunters, you, you spend that money on that bundle. People want to know where it goes, you know, and, yeah, it's, and, and it's a good thing. It, it's, yeah. And it's, we hunters and fishermen are paying for what yep. we do. You so, pay you pay for your state fish and wildlife biologist, your your fish hatcheries, your conservation officers, and you know they they and they do more. You know that's why a conservation officer would ask you or a game warden, whatever whatever right, the state right. calls it. That's why they ask, hey, what you know? That's why they ask you for your hunting license, right? And you know, make sure you're, you know, you're paying your part, you right. know, and, and that's and it's all going back into what we're doing. Yeah. So, yeah. so that's it's what pays conservation. Yeah. Yep. That's what pays salaries. That's what pays for equipment because it, it's costly. I mean, they're proper, you know, you have in any other called fish and wildlife areas, Kentucky, other places are called WMAs, wildlife management areas or fish and wildlife areas. That's what pays for the John Deere tractor that goes out. Like, let's say if it's a wetland or waterfowl place to, disc up their moist soil unit and allow native plants to regenerate and then they flood it they ha- then that's what build the dam that dams up the water and the water control structure that controls the water so it's at a perfect depth for waterfowl hunting gotcha and so it, it all goes into a system and it and it's amazing it is i mean that's people that design that are smarter than i could ever be <clears throat> excuse me and the biggest and that's what a lot of people don't understand is what that money goes to. Right. And, yeah. and that's what we're learning. Yeah. Stretch reading so, your ear, bud. And love, th- I mean, it's, we love doing what we do. So you gotta, you gotta you know, pay, pay your dues. Yeah. But to break us up just a second, we always have this conversation with roller and it's called what kind of jerky, Matt? Beef Go- jerky. Goose jerky. No. Oh. And have you eaten goose jerky, Andrew? Roller loves it. <laughs> no. Roller loves it. No. I make it myself. I make it. And he's going to tell me he makes it the right way so it tastes good. We've got you coon coming. We're going to get you some goose jerky coming. What else could what else could you want? I don't know, Merle. He want Well, but here's what's going to have to happen. Possum maybe a possum leg. We're going to have to just bring him some goose. That's oh, Right I, there's I, a feller right I here. Make, we got If you up. like roast beef, I can make you the best goose breast you'd ever eat. That I I will, you I'll take that challenge you do because it. Again, I said it on here before. I have had so many people tell me I can make it right, and I've never tasted goose that I like. I don't know. I'll, man. I'll be it's... your huckleberry right there. All right. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a challenge. Know, we start going back, and now we're let's fast forward. Now we're in the '60s, '70s. We're kind of back in that. This is kind of the new resonance, renaissance of wildlife management. You had Nixon. You know, he created EPA, had all these environmental regulations that started coming for it because again, we had that. We had water coming in. You had bad, you know, everybody's getting bad water from envir- from coal mines or from what have you. People dumping, you know, literally human waste in the river system, and that's causing getting people sick and everything. So that helped out a little bit. And then, you know, with these surface mines, and I, I just know this because I did a lot, spent a lot of time on coal mines in eastern and western Kentucky. Uh, when you get up there, it's beautiful but sometimes it's like i said it goes back to those invasive species or those species that aren't really good like cerisa lespediza yep now when you're sitting there talking about these coal mines my mom has property in kentucky and i went down there and i seen it 
now for a coal mine to turn that back now. Would, and we would not have these laws and regulations if it wasn't for Congress and everybody, the forefathers, what he's talking about now. When we stepped on that, they have to plant that all back into native species yes. on that property. When I walked down through there, I seen elk sign. Of course, this is in Leslie County. Elk sign, mm -hmm. bear scat. I don't know how many, how many turkeys we've seen fly up. And there was quail everywhere. And there was, um, what's the little bird there I just mentioned there a while ago when we sat there talking about it? But I'm drawing a blank. It happens to me once in a while. A robin? No. <laughs> you eat Sorry. A quail. Quail. No. Uh, pheasant. Nope. Ducks. Nope. The ones that are real fast. And you fly. Roadrunners. No. Oh, woodcock. Nope. Uh, grouse. Grouse. There we go. There we go. Grouse. But I don't I, think you've mentioned I, grouse at all tonight. I, yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We have. We talked about <laughs> no. grouse earlier. I know we did. No. But anyways. Uh, I'll run grouse. the tape back. I don't believe that happened. <laughs> I don't either. <laughs> But the grouse, I mean, I've not seen, the last time I've seen a grouse, I was hunting behind Star of Hollow Lake. And that's the last time I've seen a bobcat, too. The grouse came through there, and it wasn't probably 45 minutes, and then here comes the bobcat. Yeah. And that was back in the late, probably late to mid-90s. And so that's the last time I've seen stuff. But getting back to that native stuff down there in Kentucky, yeah. that stuff's thriving. And it's just like hunting up in northern Indiana. And I've hunted up there a lot. And that's probably, I've seen more deer and game in northern Indiana than I have anywhere. And that even counts probably going down to Kentucky. Those guys turbo till. They leave the fence rows in, most of them anymore. And they're just, it just seems like it, like he was talking about, the land takes care of itself. Yeah. I mean, the deer have plenty to eat on stuff and it gets cold up there. There's cover. There's, the deer are hardier. I mean, by far than they are here. Mm -hmm. But those guys, it seems like they got it going on from up there above Lafayette on. And they're behind the times and stuff a little bit. But just like Andrew said, I mean, it's just the habitat that'll grow that stuff. A lot of fence rows getting cleaned out. Yeah. And, you know, and it takes away. And you see these guys, though, complain about erosion. You know, and it's just out there where I live. I mean, you'll see them. I mean, they're, they're gaining that little bitty bit. Right. Supposedly clearing that tree line out. And I, and I don't care if people get mad at me about this or not. But when you see that washout down through there that stretches for a mile long, what are you gaining? Nothing. You're not gaining. A little bit. A little bit. Not, you're not, not enough gaining to enough rip out to all do. the habitat, in my Correct. Opinion, but. Correct. And, you know, and those guys, are, and they're going to the extreme. Yeah. All around Tampico. And it's not just in Tampico. It's everywhere. But, you know, oh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get, you know, another bushel and a half of corn. No, you're not. No. It's going to wash out. There's nothing there to hold subsoil back. And that's what a lot of, you know, there's all these federal programs, you know, CRP, WRE, which is the wetland, and then you go back to the kind of the crop set-aside programs, EQIP, QIP. Um, there's a couple, there's various other, there's more government acronyms, and I could, we call it the alphabet soup. And, you know, it's kind of on, you know, the landowner themselves to, you know, if they, it's all about what they want. You know, of course, it's their property. Right. They're going to do what they want. But if you have somebody that's a hunter or someone that leases it and bring that, it, bringing that, it, creating that edge habitat, even if it's twenty feet, it would, it'd be amazed, you'd be amazed to see how much more deer use that. Oh yeah, quail. Uh, I know. I've said a lot of fence, fence row rows bucks and, and just, just that just fence row out. habitat. Yeah, right. And you know, you get in that briar nasty stuff. You don't want to walk through there unless you're chat. You know, you got canvas head to toe. That's what your smaller game like. And, you know, smaller game feeds bigger game, and it creates more. It's the biggest thing I tell everybody it's a cycle. It's all about the cycle of stuff. Right. And nat the way nature was designed was that everything replenishes itself. That's right. why, if, you know, deer, if there are too many deer, that's where you have, you know, episodic hemorrhagic disease, which is EHD, blue, or also called blue, blue tongue. tongue. That's a way for nature to control itself. Right. Man, we just, we try and tinker with a little bit to suit our needs a little bit better which and we know, mess up and, and we yeah. mess up a lot and you know that's how you learn that's anything you you know people mess up state fish and wildlife agencies have done bad you know not necessarily bad things but some things weren't exactly 100 percent. you know okay. they tried it we're sitting here talking about this and i'm just going to ask you right now because i know you've hunted out west and stuff right now now why does ohio have bigger deer than we have why does illinois and, and we're we're going to include genetics in there Mm -hmm. 
why. Before now, you answer that question, I'm going to interrupt real quick because I'm going to be honest. We've talked about roast beef. We've talked about <laughs> alphabet soup. <laughs> and I'm getting hungry. And you guys promised a couple giveaways. And I That's say, true. yep, yep, yep. I, I know. Let's, I know you haven't announced what the prize is, but I know what it is. And we're talking about way too much food. And I'm a big guy. And I think, let's I do think it. the listeners right. probably want something. Let's do it. All right. So we're going to give a free Blondie's pizza away. And you got to answer this question. Before the end of the show, and we're going to do another one. We want to, we want to know what the three species of black bass are. The name of them. That's what we want to know. Three of there's more than three, right? There are only three black. Bass. Only three black. Okay. Three black bass. Yep. What species are the species that are in our lakes and rivers here in Indiana? And Mason Fleetwood, if you're watching, you yeah, cannot if you, get a free. Yeah, pizza you don't get bodies. one, Mason. <laughs> That's what he'll be doing. He'll be yeah. answering all the questions. Yeah. just to get a certificate back. But that's what we want to know. Black bass, what are the three subspecies that are in the lakes and streams and rivers here in Indiana? And you get a free Blondie's pizza. So while we're waiting on that, not to cut in, but we, we do have some questions. Okay, We'd like yeah. to do some interaction. Um, let's go back up here to the top. Yeah, there's Cliff a Rice joined us to, earlier. Cliff, you're still watching. Hey, hey Clifford. Um, let's see. Well... Who's your favorite pro archer? <laughs> oh, Benny. Cliff Benny. Rice wants to know. <laughs> or oh. no, Benny asked that, and Cliff wants to know. Well, now are we going full on professional, or you know, I'm going. I am going to say I'm. Going, I, I got to shout out some love to Benny Barger. Um, you know, as a bow hunter myself, I can remember back in the day, um, Slab Road did their bow shoots. Yep back in the day i and i just lived a mile and a half away from them i learned more stuff from benny and chris cooper i would love to see what's going on <laughs> um, but you know that's the thing and that, that's the thing nowadays that we need to see more of people taking the time to introduce and educate people that don't have the experience and i was going to talk about this a little bit later and in the past five to seven years there's become this new re-engagement state fish wallets are doing. They're trying to re-engage the public. Um, it's the term is R3 recruitment. That means people recruiting people to come and buy hunting licenses, retention, making sure that that person buys a hunting or fishing license the next year. And then you have reactivation, making sure they keep coming on. If they, you know, fall off a bit, they just keep coming back. back. They, yeah. you know, we always call it, you know, addicted to the outdoors or, you know, you it is a, it's an obsession. It is. And that's very true. <laughs> you know, hunting's, I think it's like less than 3% of the population in the United States identify as hunters and anglers. That's and not it's very a, many, Matt. No. It's a just to have somebody that knows that kind of just spit it now, out there. I, it could be a us. little bit higher. It could be, it could yeah. be higher. I, I just know it's, I think it's single digits, low, low teens, maybe. Those are your hunters and anglers. It is a multi billion dollar industry. So if you think about it, we care about it that much. I mean, I couldn't I couldn't tell you how much I I mean, bows, arrows, everything, yeah. guns, ammo. There's uh, a lot of my wife don't need to know. Uh, yeah, let's not be talking about <laughs> stuff like that, Chief. You know. Um you know, yeah, there's a lot of wives at home right now taking that $14 billion yeah. and trying to divide it by the percentage. <laughs> divide it by the exactly. right here. <laughs> and yeah. they're, they're thinking, hmm. Um, so, let, you know, I'm going to talk, and we kind of skipped a little bit. I was going to talk a little about 90s and kind of what where this all came from. You know, back in the 90s was the prime age of deer hunters. More people deer hunted in states than they, than they ever did. And it started trickling down. And you can, you know, you can take that to baby boomers. Our pop, you know, the U.S. population jumped up after World War II. You know, that's why we have baby boomers. Right. And now those baby boomers are starting to get a little older. They're dying off. There's not that young people, younger folks to come in and replace them. Right. And so that, you know, that's created a problem. I mean, we were talking about this over. We have, you know, there's half as many deer hunters as there used to be. And what state and federal agencies are doing, that's, you know, you're talking about the family fishing weekend at Muscatatuck. Yeah. Um, it's getting the public involved and trying to get them to learn fishing, learn hunting. I can remember as a college student, we did what's called these mentor deer hunts. And I can tell you, I've never seen anything work so much than these oh, mentored yeah. hunts. Yeah, that is For sure. We would go out, they had, you know, we had started off with nine 
mentors, just people that have hunted and feel comfortable taking people out. I went, I went, we went out to this uh, WMA out in eastern Kentucky, kind of northeastern Kentucky. What's your abbreviation stand for, Andrew? WMA Wildlife Management Area. So that is yep. a piece of property that the Kentucky Fish and Wildlife owns, and they manage for hunting, fishing, and general environment in the general environment. Um, we go out there, and ironically, this is where they have kind of a uh, con- what they call conservation camps, and that's where youth come out there. They get their hunting and fishing lot, their hunting license, or their orange card. Yeah, got you. And they learn, you know, they shoot bows, they shoot guns, and they had the space for us. So we went out there. Now, we were never overly successful, um, but we were on weekends that you know we know that that was their lowest use weekend. They again, they that's why you always ask to. That's why you're always asked to fill out a card if you go to a public hunting spot to say, hey, I hunted this day. Right. Um. But it ain't the president or anything. Who's the, who, who, while he's checking his phone, who, who got the answer? Who's the first one? Well, you we know? can't count the first one. <laughs> he's, he's, no, we can't count him. Is it Coop? <laughs> he's out. Shout out I, for you, Cooper. I'm glad you come out. in there. Cooper's you're out, out bud. No, you, I heard he, I, I heard he still got it, but he was donating it back to the show. Yes, so. he's donating it back okay. to the show. So he was second in line here, Roller. Uh, We're see. doing this legit here. We got the man with the plan. Jonathan Hall. John Jonathan Hall. Hall. You're the winner. Free large pizza, bud. It only costs you five bucks to get it. Just get a hold of me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we'll mail that out to you, John. So give us your address and stuff here at the end. Just let's let's do this. While you, we'll go ahead and do the other one. Go ahead, and Chief. then while we're waiting for people to answer, then we'll finish the nineties and All get right. to the end. Yeah. That. Okay. So here's the next one. Here's another now, large I, pizza. Am I out on these as well? What? Am I out on these as well? Yes, yes Roller. Oh, well, no. well, well, I know, on, but. but He's wanting a pizza tonight. You know what? <laughs> we'll get a hold of Mason. This is what we'll do. Mason, I know you or Colton once watching. Colton was earlier. Yep, Colton. I, and and I know they'll watch end, end up watching it later. But we want what kind of pizza do we want next week, Roller? Me and Matt are bring it. What do we want? Man, I don't care. I'll eat anything. Pepperoni, sausage, mushroom, bacon, Perfect. extra cheese. Yes. You heard it, guys. That's what we want. <laughs> We're starving. When is your birthday? But I I don't can't remember. Well, right here. No. Yes. No. Right Happy early birthday to my little brother Merle. When is your birthday? It is Thursday. So next Tuesday night we're gonna have a special birthday oh, segment yeah. for <laughs> Merle on Who's Your Hardwoods Live. No. Okay, so did well, you the, ask a question? <laughs> the question next week will be how old is he? How old is yeah, he? Yeah, just we'll just wait till next week on that one. <laughs> did you ask the other question? No, you are Chief. Okay, here I we go. This one. Let me have the question. I don't even know where the question was. <laughs> did, good notes make good folks. I can't even read this. Okay, so here we go. The next question for a large pizza from Blondie's. One topping. Name four subspecies of turkeys in the continental United States. It'll, it'll institute the Grand Slam for you. Yes. Name what four them. birds make the Grand Slam? Come on, go. guys. Think um, about that one. The Grand Slam. The 90s. Right. The 90s. 90s. So we're we back. started get, and so we started to get that trail off. You know, the baby boomers started dying into the early 2000s. And so that created a huge decrease. And so now state, our state and federal agencies are doing this R3 again, like I mentioned. Recruitment, retention, reactivation. And so I was talking about those mentor hunts. Now, we were never overly successful. Um, you know, not everybody killed a deer. We might have harvested a, one or two. And we come up and it was always great to harvest something, or we, you know, pop, you know, try and maybe find a roadkill or something like that. Right. Yeah, eat roadkill, man. Get permit not for bad. it. Not bad. Um, but we would then go in <laughs> and teach people how to gut an animal, how to skin it, how to cook it, because there's now it's a new movement. It's called the locavore movement. I'm sure everybody's kind of pushed this out. You know, you've heard shout out to your small businesses. Yep. Support your small business. Support your local farmer. This is what the, this is, you know, organic. They're, everybody's wanting to eat healthier. You can't get more healthy than wild game. It's true. And yeah. honestly, it makes taste better. I think. Yeah. Um, I've I've lived out of a deep freezer for about five years, and he's an eligible. Go ahead. All right. I, uh, you know, it's become such a big thing you know people talking about homegrown food grow doing their own gardens and you have these people especially in urban areas i mean i've done events in Louis- in louisville of all places where you know you have your urban deer zones in indiana yep. you have people hunting in suburbs 
you know, of course, bow hunting. Of Did course. you see a lot of deer? I would like to do that on a really good one. I mean, I've, I've seen never some done guys it. kill some big deers on those things. Um, I can tell you, I've worked at check station. Not, it's a we were checking for CWD, chronic wasting disease, yep. which is another big topic for whitetail deer management. Um, but you know, people tell me, "Oh, I killed this behind my house. I live in the suburbs." You know, yeah, it's amazing, and you can kill some big deer. Yep, you can harvest some big ones back. I mean, oh, I've yeah. seen it. Big ones. I've seen it. Um, and we go in, and people are wanting to grow, to make their own food. You know, it's all about self-sustainment, sustaining yourself. And I can tell you, I get it. I have great take bright take great pride in it. You know, you look at some of these bigger guys out. I know some one of the biggest guys out there as far as this movement on television is Steve Rinella, the meat eater. Meat eater. Yeah, now, Tristan watches that yep. guy. Yeah. That guy, Steve Rinella. I've met him a couple times. Um, you know, of course, just, you know, the autograph line and, you know, got to talk for maybe five minutes, which was longer than a lot because there was a line a mile long. Right. But, you know, I kind of told him what I do, for, what I do for a living and, you know, where and where I come from. And he, we sat there talking, you know, people don't realize this, how much you, I mean, you could live off a wild game. You know, I know, I know people may have watched that Duck Dynasty show, but you have that Jace Robertson, he goes in, yeah. I don't buy meat from the grocery store. I don't either. Yeah. I have two industrial freezers in my basement the only thing that i'll get from the store is some chicken breast once while and that's it yeah, yeah. i mean salmon I, for me too i gotta i yeah, gotta, I gotta have the salmon I, you're right i get the salmon but did you know i know a guy and i helped this guy he wanted to drop some weight and you know he didn't want to do any diet pills or anything else and and this is the truth i had almost quit deer hunting for the year me and tristan had harvested so we i told tristan i said let's help this guy so we harvested some more deer. The only thing he put on that deer was black pepper. Mm-hmm. In three months, he dropped 75 pounds. In really? Three months. And the only thing he put on that deer was black pepper, and that is the truth. 75 pounds. Lean. Months. As long as he co- cooked it to a nice medium. Medium, Correct. medium rare. I can attest that because they don't, the fact is they don't have the amount of fat. Right, and no. so that it doesn't, you don't get that flavor. So cooking it to a medium, medium rare, whatever you're comfortable with, that's where it's nice and tender, full of flavor. Um, and you know, you go into Steve Brunella. Anybody that wants to learn how to cook wild game, take a look at one of his books. Oh yeah, I mean, he's yeah. got some recipes. I mean, gourmet. Like I've never heard of it. It's called couscous, and he made it with mule deer, with mule I've deer heard meat. Of couscous sounds good. And sounds good to you, roller couscous. Yeah, with a little roast beef goose breast. <laughs> right up my alley. But, you know, and that's where we're at now. And we've seen an increase. It's not much. You know, we're still got we're still on a bit of slope, but it's still an increase. And we're getting that upward trend back. You know, yeah. as a somebody that's in the in a wildlife management biology field, we like our graphs. You know, go back to geometry, you know, everybody oh, did yeah. those graphs. Gotta have it. We love them because you get to see stuff. You know, it's all about trends and whether it's going up or down, static. Right now, we're on an upswing. And it starts going across the board. I mean, people now have, you know, people people are spending more money than they've ever had. We're starting to get that more hunters out there. And, you know, I encourage people to do the same for me because I didn't grow up hunting and fishing. My, you know, we owned a 50-acre farm out, out towards Clear Spring. You had a lot of good animals on that, bud. We used to go spotlight. I want to ask yeah. a question for you, though, from from your standpoint. Because I know this gets brought up a lot, you know, with us doing this Who's Your Hardwoods deal. And I think the hunting industry has a lot of impact on hunters today. Mm-hmm. And from your what, your opinion of the money that we spend on hunting, how much of it's needed and how much of it's not needed? See, that? I mean, I know that's kind of a big topic. But, yeah. you know, you've got, like, my grandpa used to go out in a pair of blue jeans and a flannel shirt and plaid, bud. He always had yeah. a deer hanging in the garage. Oh, yeah. But you know, like you and I were talking about earlier on the show, is your camo and your equipment yeah. you use. And one thing I'll tell anybody is get the best that you can afford. And I've heard, and I've heard this said before. I'm not. Don't quote me on that. That's not my quote. That's but, a good quote. Though. But do yeah. the best that you can afford. Do, if, yeah, do you know, what you can. if you can afford, and I'll tell you, equipment. The longer you stay out there, the more comfortable you are. The longer you be out there, the more successful you will be. Um, you know, whether it's buying that Sitka gear, Under Armour, or Tops camo, Tops, Tops camo, camo, you know, anything like that. 
it's what you can do and what you're comfortable with. You know, hunting shouldn't really bank, break the bank. Right. You know, if you know if somebody has to have, you know, a brand new bow every year, brand new guns, brand new this, this, and that. Well, you have to, don't you know that they're obsolete and they only last so long? Kind of like a computer, don't they, Matt? Yeah, but you, know, you have to. The, the, the women's watch. You got to have yeah. a new bow. Yeah. You got to have. You, just do. A, you have to have just, equipment. <laughs> there's just a lot of he's got, so I got to have it. I, yeah. I feel like there's a lot of that that goes on. And, and you know what? That and to be honest with you, that's how free market capitalism. That's how that operates. You know, hey, I got to have what that guy has. Right. And they always got to improve it better and better. I mean, you take a, you know, for a bow, for example, pull a 65-pound bow today from a brand new 2019, pull back a 65-pound bow from early 2000s. Way different. Yeah. Way different. incredibly different. And, you know, look at guns. You have $200 guns you can buy that will shoot minute of angle accuracy. Minute of angle is shooting a one inch by one inch square. You can go out to any gun store right now and... Buy it for two, one, two, three hundred bucks, and that's just the gun, not including. Scope. Okay, now we're gonna stop right there. A second, we talked about this on another show, and you've elaborated on a lot of things, and 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 we've got a lot of knowledge. Now, the amount of hunters in Indiana are down. Mm-hmm. Period. It don't matter if you're rabbit hunting, waterfowling, birding. It does not matter what you're doing. The amount of hunters is down, and we realize that they're tearing up some of the habitat. They need to leave the fence rows and stuff in. There. You're not, I mean, you know, I got a 6.5, we're going to admit it, but it's gone. But let's not say it can't come back. Exactly. Correct. That's the exactly. big But thing. my question is to you, why are we not in the heyday since we don't have as many hunters and stuff as we used to have? I, why is it not here? In your honest opinion, what do you think? It's the number of hunters. It is absolutely the total numbers, and that deals with, again, baby boomers. Uh, that is the largest our popu- the U.S. population has ever grown was back then. We don't have those anymore. People, right. Or the baby boos aren't hunting anymore. Correct. But do you think that hunter efficiency on how many animals that he can harvest is making our numbers decline? You well, think that it's three to one? I mean, this one guy, can he's harvesting and is a better hunter than the other three. Well, and see, that's another thing, too. It's not very many people, you know, talk about deer hunting for one minute. Um, over most of your deer hunters harvest one deer. Less than, you know, usually about a quarter. No, I didn't know that. Quarter. That's the number you know, I did not. 20, know. 20, 25% harvest more than two deer. And of that 20, 25%, you're looking at another, you know, you're looking at a quarter of a quarter harvesting more than two deer. So it, we're killing less deer. You know, we and it goes up and down. Like I said, we biologists like our trends, and population trends always go up and down. It's always in a, in a swing. And efficient and where i would say hunt your hunter efficiency i think that's kind of helping us more than hurting us because we're able to make ethical shots you know we know that that gun or that bow it's gonna shoot where we want to shoot back in the day men of a gun had to be a custom custom gun or you had to be one heck of a reloader or take it to a gunsmith what have you nowadays that's on the fact that's from the factory because we born a day (laughs) because hunters have demanded it you know you look at you know People that are former, former military, veterans hunting has be, been a thing ever since hunting shows have been around you, as far as seeing it. You know, you've heard, always heard about it, but now you actually see it. Or taking kids hunting, you know, it's, you got mil- military veterans that are trained on very good equipment that shoot very well. You know, you have the Marine Corps, they build their own M40s. I mean, they have, it's Marines building it for Marines. I, as far as I know, that's the last time I checked, I'm not into that world, but you have, people comes that were building custom rifles well i want that and you have these people that then go back and work in these fields and they said hey let's make a gun that shoots a minute of angle under 500 bucks and they did it yeah and it's it innovation of the outdoor industry has become it's unreal you know used to it was well let's do that let's take this uh take a fleece jacket wrap around a tree so i'm not you know i'm not scratching my back and it's not making noise well now they've got products out there that you know you tape it on you just velcro it to a tree and there's it's a fleece backing you know it's just all the little nips and tricks that your grandpa taught it is now commercialized speaking of that grandpa thing see i think that my personal opinion the number of hunters is low because well one of the reasons but like kayler was saying on the team episode we had a couple weeks ago Kids today are, and I, we go through this with our kids. All the time. But they're so involved in other stuff than 
the hunting and fishing. And I mean, when you when a kid can sit down at a table and be consumed in an, an iPad, a phone for hours and hours and hours, I we didn't I didn't have that. No, my grandpa would call me and say, "Hey, let's go run some rabbit dogs. Let's go deer hunter. Let's go turkey hunting, fishing." Yeah. That's what we done. Now you look at a kid and you say, "We're gonna go out and we're gonna get in the briars. And we're gonna." They're like, "What?" Yeah, I'm not doing that. That's I'm not a, that's not a game out. on my iPad. Right. So I think a lot of that too, you know, has a, has a role. But the thing of it is, though, is when we grew up and we hunted, we seen a lot of animals. We did. Mm-hmm. I mean, but you know, it goes back to the conservation thing. What was it in Indiana last year? You kill four four does was your bonus. You could harvest four does. It was yeah. different from county to county. Right, four and like eight in Washington County. Yeah. I'm telling you right now, I have done that. I have filled that quota in four counties. Well, I think a lot of and it too I, is, is I think a lot of it is how we hunt. Yeah. Now, I, now how you hunt is your is in my opinion is your business. I don't Correct. care. I don't criticize anyone how they hunt. No. But but the thing is, you know, we've got guys that are and gals that are leasing hundreds and hundreds of acres. And what, what kind of deer did you kill this year? Well, I didn't see the one I wanted to kill. Yeah, I didn't. I, didn't I mean, it, it, like it. Hunter satisfaction. That's, yes. That's a huge thing. So, you know, but, you, were t- you were talking about elk in Kentucky. Yeah. When I was in school, I in college, I messed with elk like crazy because that's why I wanted to go to school there. I wanted to mess with elk. I heard they had elk down there. But was that around Leslie County? I spent a few, a little <laughs> bit of time in Leslie <laughs> County. <laughs> um, you know, doing the elk management down there and one part of a PhD project that was going on was hunter satisfaction. You know, you have all these out west, you have trophy units, or you have all these different units, and the bigger the elk, the harder it is to get in. But what they found in Kentucky is that it didn't matter what the size of the bull was. They had a picture, it had 25 pictures, had everything from a spike to a 400-inch bull. No one said they wouldn't shoot the spike. No one said they wouldn't shoot the 2x2, the 3x3. Yeah. And... That's what a lot, and I'm not knocking QDMA. I'm not knocking people that only want to harvest mature bucks. My philosophy is, if it makes you happy. Exactly. You that's buy, what we talk about. You 100%. Buy, you buy the hunting and fishing license. You paid your part. You're, that's what you That's what you paid for. I yeah. agree. You get what you paid for, and I would never knock anyone. I don't care if it's a five, you know, five-year-old kid with a four-point buck or a 30-year-old guy with a, four, with a four-point buck. Yeah. If, as long as that guy's got an grin ear to exactly. ear and it tastes good yep now that's that's what matters yep. and i'm not bashing you know there is science to that if you want to get a bigger buck let the little ones walk create habitat get and you can get that you can get there plant you know i'm not saying mineral doesn't work because it does proper foods if something has like let's take um a high school kid high school high school kid if you give them the amount of food proper amount of food proper amount of exercise and resources they'll get bigger you know, you look at back in the day, George Washington was a big guy at Steen, just over six foot. But six wasn't foot he, didn't he want the national bird to be the wild turkey? National that would bird? be Ben Franklin. Was Ben Franklin. I knew it was one of them. Ben right? Franklin, I paid attention. <laughs> but that's because that's the only endemic. Now, endemic means it's only found here in in North America. Right. You cannot find eastern wild turkey. Anywhere else. Anywhere else but in North America. And, you know, that was a tall guy. Nowadays, 6'3", that's... Not oh, yeah. normal. I mean, yeah. I'm six foot. I'm six foot on the dot, and that's normal. That's become normal. So we better feed. Our, we better fed ourselves. We learned how to make ourselves better, and we end up growing more. And you know, I know it's kind of a hot talk, but the term evolution. Now, that's not the creation. I'm talking about passing genes on, survival of the fittest. You know that the the biggest animal, the biggest strongest, will survive and pass those genes on. So eventually, that's going to be your bigger, stronger animal. If you start getting bigger bucks on a property or you get a lot of turkeys, allow them to breed and they pass their genes on. Right. And that's how you get start getting those better genetics. It's hard to manipulate and it takes time. It's hard to pass them up. I, I mean, uh, it, it, it's rough. You know, for me, if it's a, if the buck is at its ears, the antlers are at its ears, that tells me that I have an 86% chance that that deer is two and a half years old or older. And a lot of people, people don't realize is, and I know this... People might crucify me for this, but a lot of your bucks that breed are your one and a half yep. to three and a half years old. Yep. yep. Because you have these big, you know, because sometimes those bucks, the older bucks don't even breed. They've been shot at so many times. And they're they survive, lazy. They, yeah, yep. they're lazy. And that, and they follow the least path resistance. If they, I ain't going to go feed tonight. I know that, I know what's coming on. You know, yeah. you had, you know, your, 
your kid doing something stupid and your dad or grandpa, I wouldn't do that because yeah. he's done it. You know, he's went, you know, you had a yeah. buck that got shot and had an arrow whiz over his head or a bullet grazed him. You know, he's going to go back. I'm not going back. And that's what, you know, they're not going to breed. So these younger bucks are the ones that are breed, the ones that are breeding. So essentially by not harvesting younger bucks, you're keeping your breeding population alive. Right. And so, and those bucks have their dad's genes, which is their, you know, you're one to harvest their dad. And so they're, you have that guy's genes getting passed on and keep getting passed on. And there's some, there's, in turkeys and, and, and deer, you have some subordinates. That's yeah. like the Missouri Monarch. Everybody, where that deer was hit on the interstate or whatever, that deer right there, everybody owned the farm all around that thing. And nobody had ever seen that deer, so they claim and, and i believe him that deer was subordinate mm-hmm. the deer had either been whipped something had happened to him he did not want to breed or anything and, it, and the same thing goes with a turkey you know yep. yet they're all subordinates and and things happen but matt you got who who won the deal jacob winnicky jacob winnicky wins the turkey deal now that boy right there come over to pick up a robinson cole sunday I spent two hours with that kid. He did give you a shout-out a while ago. Thanks for the turkey call tips. Yeah. Did and you I, see that on there? Yes, I've seen up. it, and I appreciate that. And I sat down with with him, and he took his time, and I let him play all the different calls and stuff, and he, you know, he got the sounding real good with one, and, you know, I helped him out and give him a lot of tips and stuff like that, and I like that, you know. it just He's a younger guy in his early 20s and yep. stuff, and, I mean, he's starting to call birds in for everybody else. Recruitment. Pass, yeah, recruitment, passing the torch. Yeah. I will give a shout-out. I am seeing some, uh, what I recognize as names of wild turkeys, um, and here by a, <laughs> cer- by a few couple people. Um, that takes it to a whole new level. I can tell you that's what I learned. I know we were talking about this earlier. You know, I learned a lot of what identification learn a lot what i thought i might know you know you know you have these guys that are going to school i encourage anyone to go if someone you got somebody young going to high school wanting to go to college or in college and not really thinking it's and they're a hunter or fisherman have them look at a school for wildlife fish and wildlife management you know and it's not just wildlife management that's not the only degree there's wildlife ecology natural resource management it's whatever that college calls it but you learn so much stuff and it's you learn to realize it's it's all about simple, but just taking the time and spending the time in nature to learn it. You know, I can spout out facts. You know, we were talking about this. You know, a bluegill is not a bluegill. In it's the a brim, bud, right? It's a Lapomus macrochiris. And Let's I learned, do it. Matt, you may say who's, it with us, Matt. Well, hang on a minute. Who's Jessica? Yeah, somebody <laughs> named Jessica. Where did I see that? Who, who is that? Who? Yeah, what's her name? Jessica Denton. Who is that? Is that you? Is she that had your correct yes. name. Okay, well, she no, had the correct here's, names. Here's the thing. Well, I don't even know what they say. So, what are you going to help us out or something? Because yeah. what is a what? How you how you pronounce some of them? Now, I might have. Or, and what and what is it? So, like the first one here is okay. Osceola, something Osceola. I, I thought she was called Merle names. Is what I <laughs> no, <thought. laughs> no. So you have yeah. Mel- Meligris Osceola. Okay, what is that? That's that's, that's a, an Osceola turkey. That's so Florida. that's their genus. You know, let's think back. But I know, did she come back with the scientific terminology yeah. for everything? Yes. She come back with Do you it. know her? Yes, I know her. <laughs> you better keep her, bud. Yeah, because I don't know what... So let's go... Let's just real quick before we get down here. What? Let's go through those. The the What What do you say? Meligris. Meligris Osceola. Osceola. Okay. I'm, uh, I'm taking that's a Florida bird. Yeah, that's the eastern. Or, the, or I'm sorry, that's the Osceola. Okay. Um, now see this one thing. Some people go a little bit further. I didn't learn the scientific names for for uh, ornithology. That is a study of birds. So she's got a little bit more on me on she's that. Got one. One a little on smarter. Him. Ching. <laughs> um, okay. But, you so know, what's what's the next one? Melo Meligris. 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 Mariami. Interweb or something. Like, what is it? Oh, what? that's Internata. Internate. Exactly. <laughs> see that big boy? See that Internata. <laughs> Come on, I was going to say, Merle is Bang. a Meligris. So yes. I will say, oh, yes. And it, Which one's that? that uh, I'm wanting to say that is the Eastern. I couldn't tell you. She's smarter than I am. She's we'll just lo- go with the Eastern, because it looks like an Eastern in, in, like in my, Based on Latin. You know, let's, you know, you go back to high school biology. You heard about Kingdom Phylum. Kingdom Phylum or 
or I was probably class asleep. Genus I was probably species. asleep. Was yes. you asleep, Matt, during I was that, that bar? <laughs> biology. I was probably asleep. But that's you know that's where it came from. That's what scientists, biologists, academ- academics. That's what they talk about. That's how they say something because names change. What we call an elk in the United States, North America, you go over to England. So what they call different. an elk is what we call a moose. You know, a moose is yeah. an elk over there, and you know they call those you know, European red stags. Like, we don't, no one in the United States calls, that's in, born in the U.S., calls a deer a stag. That's a European term, and it just, it's, it just stays there. It allows, sci- you know, biologists from across the world, you know, you've heard these world-famous biologists, Steve Irwin, Jane Goodall. Yeah. You know, oh, yeah. you had these, had these people, how they communicate is by, and especially when they're writing is, by those scientific names. And it is important, but it is something I would stress to anybody that would ever come into this field Learn with the public, you know. Yeah, I, yeah. you know, if, if I'm a what people call Creole clerks, you know, you go to the boat rep. Hey, what? How many fish did you catch, and what did you catch? You know, you're not going to go ask him how many Microptus salmoides did you catch. <laughs> I mean, Cropty salmoides. Yeah, what? yeah. I'm going to say know, I don't have a license for that. <laughs> <laughs> but you know that. But you go. You don't ask that. You go ask. Hey, how many largemouth bass did you catch, right. and what size were they? And it's important for these public feedbacks. It that is, they do. because that's how you get your number to balance yep, out That's everything. how you get your numbers, yep, that's how you and that's how numbers, yes. that allows people in positions like mine to do our jobs properly. Because, you know, people always talk about the waterfowl bands. Mm-hmm. What You would not believe what, and it's called banding data, how much that has given us as biologists and us as hunters. Because yeah, so. it allows us to see where the birds are going, where they're nesting, where they're, you know, if a birds captured in canada and it was done by people doing nesting surveys or live trap or trying you know people doing banding and i was like hey that bird stopped over here right you know i've you know i banded i've shot a banded goose that was banded over at monroe Le- reservoir or toyota i've shot i've i've shot ducks in kentucky that were band, banded in michigan that'd be cool well, I, I, I don't have any you know I, I've, I don't have any. I've trapped ducks on a on a public property in kentucky where that same duck that was in Richmond, Kentucky, was caught again in Starksville, Mississippi. That's cool. You know that bird went from he- from east to south, and it's phenomenal. You know, and it allows us to understand the beauty and honestly, you know, people talk about the majestic wildlife. Yeah, but you're talking about the flyaway there w- yeah. of what they're supposed to do, and it's yeah. amazing. You know, it's amazing to see, and you know, we'll get wood ducks that nest up here. You know, it's amazing that ducks that are here. We'll go all the way down south. You know, you have blue winged tealer flying in Mexico. Yeah, and you know it, it's amazing to watch and see that. If I would encourage anyone to look up, you know, ban- waterfowl banding data, and you just see this map of the United States, and it's divided up into four sections. Now, there's a little bit of crisscross sometimes, especially with the what's called the Mississippi and Atlantic flyaways. But it's cool to see where you have these red lines and all these dots come up. Where they've all been. Where they've been. Where yeah, ducks were shot. Right. That's wild. And it is. It's amazing. I mean, it. Gal- Gallipovo is. You know Easter. what? I'm saying Gallipovo. Yeah, I'm I guess reading all this. It. We're going. We might have to have Jessica Denton on the show sometime. We need to do like a scientific bird. Correct. So if we're turkey hunting together this year, I'm gonna say Matt. Look, what's he called? What's the eastern? Here call? comes a Gallipovo. Yeah, here's it comes a Gallipovo. Get ready, <laughs> bud. Here we go. <laughs> but Andrew, before we come over here, you were sitting in a Robinson call shop. Mm-hmm. Now, what did you think when I when you got to just look in there and see and pick stuff up? Your honest opinion, what did you think about that? I thoroughly enjoyed it because <laughs> one thing and I get at, I would rather see mom and pop shops, you know, that again, that goes back to that local force. Support your local businesses. And I can tell you that's a I was amazed with what can be done with slate calls. I've you yeah. know, again, like I said, the only slate calls I ever bought have been at box stores, big box stores. Right. And a lot of people don't realize what it says. You know, it may be custom, and it is custom. It's custom. You look around there, it's but, custom. you know, you're able to give to the consumer that, you know, hey, I spend about the same money. You know, people spend maybe $5, $10 more. But what did you think about the sound? Have you ever got sound like that? Not with the way you've had those calls set up. I will say that one. That is phenomenal. Yeah, no sound like that. What'd you think, Matt? 
I don't like I hand you that copper. Well, we'll see what you use in come time, bud. You won't, I want the copper one. You won't give it to me. But I might give it to you. But you're sweetening me up a little bit. If you, you buy me a Blondie's pizza or something, you know. I'll get you one right here. <laughs> <laughs> All but, right. Well, we're a quarter after nine, so. Yeah. We're right. to wrap we appreciate you coming on, Andrew, a bunch. Yeah, this hey, was there's very, a lot of very good information. Helpful. I appreciate you guys having me. I'm, um, Shout out to Tops Camo. Yes. Robinson Custom Calls, Four Seasons White Tail Provisions. Blondie's Pizza. Blondie's Pizza. Man, these give away. We're going to have to do these every week, Roller. I like that. I mean, it's, it's people, yeah. As long as we keep them Cooper or them Robinson boys out of it. Yeah, they got to stay away. Well, and let's, uh, let's throw out two here uh, the new APR podcast spread shirt. Yep, I was going to bring uh, it up. Shop. Bring it up. Uh, check out Who's Your Hardwoods. You guys have shared the, the link there. You can go to APR Podcast Studios and find that. But if you're looking for any gear from any of the APR podcast shows, Throttled Up, Married with Children, and Who's Your Hardwoods Live, um, you can go in there and directly order from them. And it, like I said, I, I've put out there, we ordered a couple sample orders, got a back within a week um, from the order date, delivered. Uh, the clothing is really high quality. I've the seen it. The screen awesome prints are good. Yep. You can customize what you want. There's everything from mouse pads and drinkware to shirts hoodies tank tops so get on there and uh all that stuff is going to come back to help these shows continue to do what yes. they do so um yeah shout out to that and if you if you're looking for some um gear go out and check out Spreadshirt uh in the apr podcast studios we will be having some uh who's your hardwood shirts too coming through full draw addiction and promo viper which They're is our, is our um, partnership with tops camo company that will be that will just have our logo and our team sponsors for our hunting deal, but the one that Dustin's talking about is awesome. Yeah. Just because there's times you just want to buy something and it's right there. You get different colors. You get a you get woman shirt, yeah. VHT, different yeah. color hoodie, whatever so, you want. Right, roller. Yeah, and we're gonna keep. Uh, right now, I got I I shot the first one out last night. Uh, the Hoosier Hardwoods design. So that that's a cool thing too. Instead of us having to have inventory. We can offer a lot of different designs. Yep. So, yeah, that was awesome. Uh, Who's your Hardwoods Live's up to three different designs right now on the site, um, and just look because uh, every few weeks we'll probably roll out a new design for one of the shows. And again, um, that that gives you the advantage of getting something you really like, yep. and and you'll be proud to wear. And for all of our followers out there, for the Who's, I know we we focus on hunting and fishing. Yeah, but Dustin and his wife Callie do an awesome job with married up with or married with children. Yep, and. Dustin and Matt Staples do an awesome job with Throttled Up. So if there's other stuff you're interested in racing, and then I know that <laughs> Dustin and Callie's brought on some yeah. awesome musicians. Yeah, we've had a little so, bit of everything. This yeah. uh, this week is Justin Underwood yep, uh, Justin's from awesome. Justin Underwood he and the Sod good. Busters. He's awesome. It's good. Um, yeah, we've, uh, it's, it's crazy. I was telling the story today. The uh, group that was on Sunday night uh, was uh, Sounds of Summer, the Beach Boys Tribute Beach Boys Band. Tribute, yeah. And they sang Surfer Girl here live. And when I posted it to YouTube, the copyright hit that YouTube thought that was the Beach Boys singing. Seriously. Yeah. Really? Wow. So that's, they, that's awesome. they, they pulled my video for copyright infringement, even though it was sung live here in the studio. Wow. So uh, go check them out. That was an impressive group and yes. uh, a lot of fun. So, so thank you for that shout out. Yeah, we're going to keep this APR stuff rolling because this yeah. is... We have a blast every Tuesday yeah. night. Yeah, so. it's fun. Yeah. And, and, like we said, want, and thank you for coming on. Yes. I mean, yeah. with you, a lot of knowledge there, but... Maybe the next time you come on here, we'll probably have you again, but you're going to have to bring us this Jessica Deaton. Yeah, because we need some scientific helpings. Yeah, because... Not I that mean, you don't know, but yeah, no, she, she she's quick. all over it. Yeah. quick, bud. Just boom. But I, need, one a, thing I need to know the scientific name for goose roast beef. Goose yeah, roast that's beef. all we want. <laughs> uh, one thing we might do during the summertime, too, is what we might do a show for... I know we talked a lot about different different topics, but... Science. There's a lot, but there's a lot too for for the the guys that fish during the summer. I mean, because oh, yeah. I know there's some you know fish hatchery stuff. And, I mean, there's just a lot of knowledge that we can throw out there on, yeah. like the, the fish, just fishing. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, a game warden's not all. I mean, he's not just checking you all the time for lights and stuff. I mean, you know, he asks you how many cropping stuff. What if he writes that down? I have no idea, but. I have been part of a krill limit like he's talking about. Mm -hmm. I mean, red ear, you got how many cropper you yep. got, yeah. bluegill, and bass, just all of them. Yep. And, you know, I, I appreciate you guys having me on here. Um, anytime you guys want any questions, you know, I wouldn't, I would love to come back on, you know, kind of get more into some different topics, maybe yep. more specifics. This was very general. Right. Yeah. Man. And, you know, I hope people take it back that maybe found a new, found respect or 
kind of maybe showing some love to their local state fish and wildlife agency, right. whether it's Indiana, Kentucky, wherever, wherever everybody's listening from, because people spend hours, you know, we, people are involved in those agencies spend hours and hours helping hunters and anglers. Oh yeah. You know, it time. I mean, I couldn't tell you how many hours I've spent helping with habitat. I mean, I, People people think people work for the state or wherever your government works six, yeah. seven and a half hours eight hours a day. I've put in my share of fifteen, sixteen, seventeen Long hour days. days. Yeah, and yeah. it because it's important. And it's because the people that are in those jobs care so much for our natural resources. Yeah. And if anybody has any questions, just Ask just us. yeah, go ahead and put it on the Who's Your Hardwoods page. We'll get a hold of Andrew if I can't answer it or Matt can't answer it. We'll get a hold of him or Jessica Denton. I know she can probably answer. She can answer. She can I answer. guarantee it. But we will get you an answer. Yeah. All right. Thanks for everybody for watching yeah, tonight, and thanks it. for having us, Dustin. And we'll be back next Tuesday night. Yep. Yeah, we'll see you. Thanks.